Today we are excited to have as our speaker, Dr. David Jeremiah. You don't need an introduction to him. You know who he is. You've probably listened to him on the radio, watched him on TV with Turning Point or his television ministry or seen him there at Shadow Mountain Community Church in El Cajon, California. What you may not know is that he is a 1963 graduate of Cedarville College at that time. And so would you join me in welcoming Dr. David Jeremiah back to the campus to speak to us today? We also have, I'm going to drop it. I can't drop my Bible there. Whew, karate finally came in handy, huh? And they can get a close-up of this if they want to, but it's the Jer- David Jeremiah Study Bible, and this is the Cedarville edition. Now, Dr. Jeremiah was kind enough to allow us to do a special Cedarville edition of the Study Bible, and I cannot tell you how honored we are to have it and the responses that we've gotten from it. I've been using mine. I've been incredibly impressed. I'll just mention two things that I was impressed with. The life application out of the study Bible that really makes it come to life as to how you can apply it. So I encourage you to get it for that. And the QR codes. I never knew that David Jeremiah was on the cutting edge of all technology, but he has QR codes in here that will take you to online resources that will give you background studies on the books and additional help as well. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that. And Dr. Jeremiah, publicly, let me just say thank you for your lifelong ministry of faithfulness and for allowing us to do the Cedarville edition of the Study Bible. We are forever indebted to you and your family for allowing us to do that. We appreciate it. It's a joy to be here, and I never come here, uh, you guys, without uh, wanting to take just a moment and pay tribute to my father, who this place is, I'm pleased, this is not named after me, I don't have any buildings named after me, this is named after my dad, and uh, I kind of grew up here, I moved here when I was in the seventh grade, I saw uh, what it takes to build something like Cedarville University, I watched it from a very close seat and saw the sacrifice my parents uh, for 50 years put into this place and so it's always an honor to come back well uh, Dr. White mentioned uh, the study Bible and it's been quite an experience with that Bible coming out this year and as some of you may know um, we were at a meeting one day and somebody said well where do you introduce a study Bible that you really want to tell everybody it's exciting and somebody came up with the idea well if you're going to do something important do it in an important place and then somebody else on my team said well what's the most important place you can think of and somebody else said Madison Square Garden and somebody else said you got to be kidding and uh, at first we were going to go to the arena and we couldn't get it because the basketball schedules hadn't been released and we're very thankful because we could never have filled that up but we went to the theater at Madison Square Garden and your president Dr. White and Dr. Dixon and his wife Uh, Dr. White's wife were there and it was quite a celebration for those of you who like uh, uh, music we had Mercy Me, Carrie Job, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Singers, Gordon Moat and we had a party and all we wanted to do that night was tell God how thankful we were for his word and we worshiped the Lord with all of our hearts it was an experience we will never forget when Dr. White asked me to come he said would you just share some of the things that you shared in New York and so I'm going to try to do that today you know whatever you think about this book this is the most incredible book in the world if you weren't a Christian if you didn't know anything about Christianity and all you knew were the statistics about the Bible you would have to step back and say whoa what's that all about the Bible is not only the best-selling book of all time But the Bible is the best-selling book every year, year after year, with no exceptions. In the United States alone, 50 Bibles are sold every minute, 72,000 every day, 26 million every year. And by comparison, just think about this, the top five best-sellers combined sold 12 million copies. The disparity between the all-time number of Bible sales and the next three best-selling single-volume books is astounding. For those of you who are into literature, here's what they look like. The top three best-selling single-volume books of all time are A Tale of Two Cities, which sold 200 million. Uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which at one time appeared in one volume, 150 million. 
and the little prince 140 million. But the Bible has sold between six and seven billion copies. The Gideons alone, during their 100 years of ministry, have distributed 1.6 billion copies of God's Word in more than 190 countries around the globe and are only one of many entities whose whole purpose is to distribute the Word of God. More people read the Bible than any other book, and without question, it is the most important book in the whole world. In fact, if you were to go into history and delete every biblical reference from the great art and literature of our world, our galleries and our libraries would shrink in half. Artists and poets, writers and sculptors, musicians have filled the world with their works based on biblical themes, and no book has ever inspired as much creativity as the Bible. Written over 1,500 years by more than 40 human authors from all walks of life, from kings to farmers, historians to fishermen, prophets to apostles, written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, in four geopolitical regions, the Middle East, Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, and Southern Europe. The Spirit of God moved upon the writers of the Scripture so that as they wrote, their words were nothing less than the very words of God Himself. And yet at the same time, the author's own styles and personalities are evident. Truly, the Bible is a book that is unique among all other books. It is a book to change your life. Now the Bible's always been a difference maker, making bad people good, good people better. The Bible's pages glow with the grace of God and continue to provide hope and meaning for all who will look to it for help. And if you want to know what the Bible says about the Bible, the best place to look in the Bible, I think, is Psalm 19. So if you have a Bible with you, even if it's not a Jeremiah study Bible, I could give you the page number, but that's a little bit strange, so I won't do that. But um, find Psalm 19, and I want to kind of take just a few moments today and walk through that with you, if that's all right. The Hebrew poets from whom we get the Psalms uh, put their writings together much differently than we do. Not only was there poetic structure, but there was architectural structure. You could see how they thought and how their processes worked. In many of the Psalms, there is a beautiful organization that unless you can see it in the Hebrew language, you don't understand it. C.S. Lewis once said that this Psalm, Psalm 19, was the greatest poem in the, in the Psalter with the greatest lyrics in all of the world. And the reason that I love this psalm is simply because it's arranged so beautifully. And I'm going to read this psalm to you in a way you've probably never read it, because this is the way the Hebrew poets thought. Notice how it falls into these sections. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Now you notice the psalm is not only written this way, it's written this way. And if you look down the first column, what you have in the first column are a bunch of synonyms for the Bible, different ways of describing the Bible. So just look down that column and here's what you see. The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and the judgments of the Lord. These are all just different ways of talking about the Bible. And the interesting thing about all these terms is these are not terms uh, that portray the Bible as a book just to be read. These are terms that portray the Bible as a book to be obeyed. Look down again. What do you do with the law and the testimony and the statutes and the commandments and the judgments? You obey them. 
the psalmist wanted to convey with his synonyms of the Bible that this is a book you don't just read, this is a book you obey. You don't get smarter by reading this book, you get better by reading this book. Now in the second column, he gives us some adjectives. And uh, adjectives, as you know, are given to us in the English language to describe nouns, to give content or meaning to nouns. Notice the words in the second column. David describes the Bible as perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, and righteous. And the Bible is all of that. But the main thing in the psalm is in the third column. And that's where I want you to notice what the psalmist says about the Bible because here's what he says the Bible will do for you. These are verbal participles or participial verbs or however you want to speak of it. And as you read down the third column, you really have an outline from the psalmist about how the Bible can work in your life and in mine. And I want you to just watch this. First of all, the Bible will restore your soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Psalm 19.7. Now what does that mean? It means that the Bible is God's agent for salvation. It is through the Bible alone that we learn how to come to God. If you read the first part of Psalm 19, it will tell you who God is. But it won't help you know how to know Him except through through, uh, general revelation. You need something beyond general revelation if you're going to know what God expects of you. And so here in these verses, we are told that the Word of God is God's agent for salvation. Now, I want to say something to you, and I want you to listen carefully. Nobody can ever be saved without the Word of God. And you're going to say, no, that's not true. I was in a camp. The guy didn't even have a Bible. Get up, and he spoke, and I got saved, right? Well, that might be true, but whatever he said came out of the Bible. If you got saved listening to it, Because there are two things without which no one can come into a condition of redemption and salvation. One is the Word of God and the other is the Spirit of God. And the psalmist says, the Word of God will convert your soul. I love how Peter put this in 1 Peter 1.23. He says, we are born again through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. You may be in this room today and You've yet to put your trust in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you where you're going to find how to do that. You can look at all the books you've ever seen, but you'll only find it in one book. This is the only book that will ever tell you how you can know God in a personal way. Number two, uh, in the next part of the column, we read that the Bible will renew your mind. It It says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Did you know that this Bible will give you practical guidance to keep you out of trouble. If you read the Bible every day, there will be some things you think about doing that you won't do because you read something about it in the morning. The Bible is God's manual to help us practically live the Christian life. Somebody said it's God's owner's manual. Uh, I always wonder if that's a good illustration because most of us don't even look at those. We get stuff and we don't even read the owner's manual. But we ought to read God's owner's manual. Let me tell you what I know. You should read the Bible because if you don't, you'll wish you had. (laughs) I cannot tell you how many times I've come to this book, not even sometimes devotionally, but maybe to prepare a sermon. And in the reading of the scripture, God has given me the wisdom I needed for a decision I didn't even know I was going to have to make before the day was over. This book is a wonderful source of wisdom for all of us. Third, the Bible will rejoice your heart. Now that may seem like a rather stilted statement, but I got it right out of the scripture. Here's what it says. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Did you know when you read the Bible, it brings you joy? The Bible is meant to bring joy to your heart. Now, I'm talking about the Psalms and the Proverbs and Somebody asked me, where do you start if you're going to start reading the Bible? Don't start in Leviticus. Start in the Psalms. Start in John. Start someplace. But when you start in the Bible to read it carefully, sometimes you will find so much joy welling up in your heart. You won't know what to do with it. I remember a story that someone gave me about a wonderful song that I've loved for a long time. One day an Australian 
a woman named Darlene Sheck was battling depression. And it was back in 1993, and her burdens were overwhelming. There seemed no solution for her problems, but Darlene's family was a Christian family, and Darlene had begun to learn the power of God's Word. And so that particular day when she was really down, she reached for her Bible. And as she poured over Psalm 96, the Lord used His Word to meet her innermost needs. Nearby, there was an old piano that she had gotten from her parents when she was five years old. And she went over to the piano and she began improvising a song based on Psalm 96. And as she praised the Lord, her depression began to lift and her faith and her joy in the Lord returned. It never dawned on her that day that the song she would write would become one of the most popular praise and worship songs of all time, Shout to the Lord. And whenever we sing that song, we need to remember that it was written by someone who was depressed until she read the Psalms. And the Word of God buoyed her up and she began to rejoice in her heart. I know that as students, you have your ups and downs. But the one thing that will help you not to get too high or get too low is the Word of God. It will keep you on an even path and you will find so much joy in this book. The Bible will also refocus your vision. Here's the next thing on the list. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And here's what this means. God's Word gives you clarity of vision. It helps you see things as they really are. Do you know that's one of the most important things in our world today, you guys? Because we are so good at spinning stuff. My son Daniel is, a, is an analyst for the NFL Network. And uh, he works with all these guys, and, and uh, he's on, their, on the television all the time. And uh, one day I was watching his show, and, and uh, the, another show came on before he was going to do his next set. And this guy came on. They were talking about this athlete who was at the end of his career, but he didn't know it. He thought he was still as good as he used to be. And they said of him that he was the president of the state of denial. And I thought to myself, wow, I know some citizens of that state. You know, there's a lot of people that live in denial. Did you know that? They don't want to ever deal with reality. The Bible will make you deal with life as it is. I read recently that the difference between the Bible and other books is you read other books, the Bible reads you. And I want to ask you, have you been read lately? Because when you read the Bible, it's like a mirror, and it helps you to see. And you, you see, if, if we don't want that, then don't fool with it. But if you want to be better than you are, you have to see what you are so you can see where the world of improvement is. And you can't do that by denying reality. The Bible will refocus your eyes. And then the Bible will reinforce your life. I know this is a lot to take in, but just think about these things and meditate on them when you read the psalm. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. You know, nothing's forever today, is it? I'm telling you about our marriage for 50 years. Do you realize how unusual that is? I mean, we're like, uh, we're very unique. (laughs) And that's a testimony to the patience of one woman. I can tell you that right now. But... It doesn't seem like anything lasts. But the Bible and its truth is forever. It will never fail. It will never change. It will never let you down. It cannot ever be out of date. You can count on it to be there for you when you need it. It endures forever. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven, says Psalm 119. Uh, This year I was listening to uh, CNN I uh, didn't say this in New York, but I can tell you, I was watching Pierce Morgan, who's not one of my favorite people. And uh, he was interviewing a preacher. And uh, during the interview, they got into some of the social issues that always get discussed when you get on a talk show. And he turned to this preacher and he said, when are you Christians ever going to drag your Bible into the 21st century? Unfortunately, my friend was kind of taken aback by that and he didn't know what to say. But when he asked that question, I knew immediately that he had not read the Bible. 
Because the Bible speaks to the issues of our day, and the fact that we don't like what it has to say does not render it irrelevant. (laughs) There is certainly a need for change, no question about it. But the change is not dragging the Bible into the century, but it's dragging the century back to the Bible. (laughs) Because everything that we know about the Bible, upon which this country was founded, it's all up for grabs right now. The Bible doesn't need to change. We need to change. In fact, I believe the Bible and its message is really the only hope we have for our country going forward. And then the Bible will replace your doubts. Psalm 19.9 says, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, where do you get truth today? People say, well, not all truth is in the Bible. That's absolutely right. Not all truth is in the Bible, but everything in the Bible is true. And when you come to the Bible and you read it, you can count on it. If it's in the Bible, it's true. If this life were laid out in front of us and we had to pick from a long menu on, a, uh, on the table, can you tell me anything you're absolutely certain is true? You'd be hard-pressed to come up with much, but I can tell you one thing. When you open this book every morning and you get it in your heart and get it in your mind, you're dealing with truth. This is the living truth of Almighty God. Every part of God's word is true, all of it from the beginning to the end. And I make that statement as a guy who's watched over 40 years of teaching the word of God as brighter minds than mine would ever be have gone after this book and tried to discredit it, disprove it, and, and, and deny its truth by their research. And you know what's happened, young people? Almost every single one of them in the process have become followers of Jesus Christ. Because they've examined the raw evidence, and when they examined the raw evidence, what happened was they discovered it's true. It really is true. When you read the Bible, you can have the confidence that it has withstood centuries of attempts by brilliant minds to discredit it, and it still stands strong, unbending, and irrefutable. The Bible is God's word, and it cannot ever be denied. And the Bible will reorder your values. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. I've got to tell you a little secret here before I give you the rest of this little point. When we got to New York, we had invited so many people to come. And you know, you kind of do that. If you have a PR department, they just do it. I didn't know about this. About a week before the event, a uh, guy who works in that department came to me and he said, Dr. J., I think Donald Trump's coming to your event. I said, yeah, right. He said, no, no, I think he's coming. Well, make a long story short, he came. He walked in with his wife, Melania, and they sat in the third row right here. And, you know, that's pretty intimidating. I got to tell you that. We had some sections where I got up and had to get up. I I went back after the first segment. My wife said, honey, you can't just watch them all the time. You got to look at the rest of the people. I mean, I have to believe, I was transfixed by him. I'm not kidding you. And he's obviously probably one of the most powerful people in New York. I don't know what you think about him, and it really doesn't matter. But he came to this event. And, of course, he's an incredible businessman, entrepreneur. Now, what I'm about to tell you, I had written weeks before this ever happened. I didn't know Trump was going to be there. But as I got into this at night and began to realize where I was going, I thought, oh, my goodness. What am I doing? So now you know the picture. Here's what I want you to know. John Piper made the following comments about this verse about more to be desired than gold. Here's what he said. If you have a choice between the word of God and gold, choose the word of God. If you have a choice between the word of God and much gold, choose the word of God. If you have a choice between the word of God and much fine gold, choose the word of God. The point is plain. The benefits of knowing and doing the word of God are greater than all that money can buy. So if you are tempted to read the stock page before you read the Bible in the morning, remind yourself that this is not shrewd behavior. It's like like the child who chooses the penny over the dime because it's bigger. Adults look on and shake their heads and try to teach children how to see what is really more valuable. There is no doubt the way the angels in heaven look down at childish businessmen who study the stock page before they study the Bible. 
There's a difference, however. The benefits of the Word of God over the benefits of gold are far greater than 10 to 1. And I must confess, I did one of these. (laughs) He was still there and still connected. And when I got home, he sent me the greatest letter. Tell me what a joy it was for him and his wife to be there. And we gave him copies of the Scripture. And you know, when you think about it, you might want to pray for them. You know, that God would use his Word in their lives. The Bible will also redirect your path. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. The Bible not only encourages us, but it warns us. It is a book that opens doors to us and closes doors against us. God tells us in this book that there are some things we shouldn't do. And we say, well, I don't like that God tells me we shouldn't do. But stop and think about it. Would the God of heaven who gave you his only begotten son to be your savior, would he tell you not to do something because he's trying to keep you from the best thing in life? He tells you no because he's got a much better yes that will get destroyed if you buy into the no. So read the Bible. And when you come up against something and it says and you thought you might want to do it, and the Bible says don't do it, God's been around a lot longer than you have. Take his word. You'll never be sorry. I wish I could have loaded you all up and taken you in a bus or a big plane or something and taken you to New York City. That two hours that we spent was probably one of the most special times of worship I've ever been a part of in my life. It was not about Dr. Jeremiah. It was not even about the study Bible. But God was exalted and God's word was lifted up. And those singers were absolutely amazing. And you heard Dr. Jeremiah today. I appreciate your stand for God's word. I appreciate the investment of your family in Cedarville University. And our line, as you look at the seal, is for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And as you go out and all the competing voices that are trying to convince you of what to do with your life, my prayer is you listen to God's word first. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and you'll be dismissed. Lord, you tell us in your word that the flowers wither and the grass fades, but the word of God will endure forever. So, Father, today in the hearts of all of those who are present, all of those who may watch this online later on, Lord, I pray that you would convict us and you would renew us to spend time with you, to spend time in your word, to listen to what you would have to say to us, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And, Father, if there's someone here who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, who has never repented of their sins and put their faith and trust in you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. God, I pray that we would live our lives in a way that would follow your truth and exalt your son. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.